at TU Darmstadt, where he was appointed uh, professor of civil engineering and took over as head of the Test and Research Institute. Before being elected uh, president of the university, he held the position of dean of the newly established civil engineering faculty. Jan Warner headed the university from 1995 to 2007 and succeeded in making the first autonomous University of the Federal Republic of Germany. Jan Warner has been awarded numerous prizes and positions, such as the prize of the Organizations of Friends of Technical University for outstanding scientific performance. He was also appointed the Berlin Brandenburg Academy of Sciences and to the Convention for Technical Sciences, and is the representative of technical science section of the, the Leopoldina, the National Academy of Sciences of Germany. Jan Warner has also received numerous honorary doctorates and awards throughout his long career, including the Federal Cross of Merit of the Federal Republic of Germany for his continuous efforts regarding the next generation of scientists and Germany as a location for science, technology, and engineering. Thank you so much, Jan, for joining us today. We're really excited to hear from you. Thank you very much, Tara, and I can tell you all what you said does not help me to have more space in the coffin, so it's uh, just the past. Um, so I would like to change it to share with you a presentation and I hope that this is working. It's always uh, fascinating whether it works or not, uh, but I hope it is working. Um, and so what I would like to do is um, to show you a presentation about uh, either future plans, in particular in exploration. So I hope you can see my presentation. We can see now. it. That's very good. Okay, so I will try to give you a little bit of insight what we are doing, how we are doing it, and especially also what we, what you can expect from the future. First of all, we all should be aware what uh, space is really. Space is a bridge over troubled water. I know you are young people, so Simon and Garfunkel, maybe for you just history, but for me, these two uh, had a very nice song. It was called Bridge Over Troubled Water, and I believe that space is really a bridge over troubled water. With space, we can bridge uh, earthly conflicts, um, earthly power games, nationalism, sanctions, imperialism, all of this. But as you see, I'm a civil engineer, so I selected this picture, which does, which does not show a bridge uh, of really big stability. And that means we all have to work permanently that this bridge is really working well in the future. Um, so, um, you might know that ESA gets that money from uh, the member states. We have 22 member states, so we are the one and only international uh, space agency. And therefore, every three years, I have to go to the ministers or they come to me and I have to convince them to put the money into ESA. And as for that, there must be a narrative. And this is also what I would like, if you allow me to give you a little bit of recommendation when you are in a position that you should convince other people, try to have a narrative, try to have an overarching narrative to what you want to do and why you want to do. That's very important. So for instance, this picture is the original picture I showed to the member states in uh, at the end of last year to all the ministers and said, these are our destinations. It is the society at large. And that means even individuals, we are um, trying to convince that space is uh, value for them with navigation, with telecommunication, with, with whatever. But it's also for economy, for uh, the industry. So it's uh, supporting industry and space can help to overcome problems we have the, with the environment, be it on the surface of the earth, like climate change, or be it in space uh, with space debris, etc. And this is uh, also during my period as Director General of uh, ESA, what we developed in order to have this narrative also with the uh, foundation. Because when you ask people about space, they normally directly enter into their specific field. And this is sometimes not the right way to go forward. So I developed this narrative of ESA, showing to the, man, to, to, to the public what ESA is doing. ESA is doing science and exploration. We are sending robotic spacecraft into space in order to discover new, set, new planets, in order to look for dark matter, dark energy, black holes, etc., gravitational waves. But we are also sending spacecraft uh, to the next planets um, and to land there. And therefore, for us, science and exploration has these two uh, aspects. Science is for us to look really into the universe, and exploration means for us to go to some planets or moons. And then we have safety and security from space and in space. That means 
um, for instance, in space, space debris, nearest objects, uh, space weather, uh, all of this. And from space, that means, for instance, uh, earthly catastrophes like uh, tsunamis, earthquake, etc. Then we have the applications, Earth observation, uh, navigation and telecommunication, and finally what we call enabling and support, where we are developing new launchers, new technologies, uh, and of course also operating our uh, spacecraft. So these are the four pillars uh, which uh, constitute ESA, but uh, all of them have to be linked to each other, and therefore we have now also multi-directed activities. For instance, uh, downstream gateway, which links what we are doing in space and for space, linking it to the general public. We call it one space to the customer, um, so that uh, also individuals, companies, uh, small and medium-sized enterprises, but also the non-space sector can have access to ESA. As I mentioned uh, last year, I had to go to uh, the member states, they came to me in CV in Spain, and I proposed a full program, and uh, that's very, very fascinating process. So we do not have a budget year by year, but decided by uh, any Congress or something like that, as uh, with NASA. So in our case, uh, the, di the Director General has to send proposals to the member states, and then they, then they can subscribe for the one or the other program. So I had a full list of programs with missions to Mars, with Earth observation, with telecommunication, with navigation, etc., and uh, then they subscribed, and uh, it was a very successful uh, uh, meeting because they subscribed for 14.5 billion euros, which is for three years, and some of the program are a little bit longer, but that's the main message. And you see here the distribution, science and exploration, applications and enabling support, approximately the same amount, and then safety and security, which was a totally new pillar. Uh, it started now with 5%, and I'm quite sure that this will increase. But let's have a look to exploration. What are we doing in exploration, and why are we doing something in exploration? There is a philosopher who said, we will not cease from exploration until we come back to where we came from and see the place for the first time. I must say, as a civil engineer, I don't really know and understand what he was saying, but I think it's a good quote, and therefore sometimes good quotes are necessary to convince people. We are going to the International Space Station. This is, of course, one of our destinations. Uh, and you, as you know, this is one, also one instrument which is really preaching, uh, preaching earthly crisis. So we had, for instance, also uh, Luca Parmitano uh, was on the space station. He was uh, doing several EVAs. And um, at that time, he could also upgrade the AMS, the Alpha Magnetic Spectrometer, which was very important. And we are from a European side, we are very happy that he could have these red stripes at his uh, leg and also uh, on his uh, rucksack, because this shows that he was the master of the EVA. What are the next destinations? Where to go? Uh, that's always a question. Um, I must say that we should never talk about any ultimate goal because humans never stopped with any broader, they always uh, went uh, further on, and therefore I recommend not to talk about any ultimate goal. We should look into the future. So for ESA, for exploration, we have three destinations. This is uh, lowest orbit, Moon and Mars, and we call this a European Exploration Envelope Program, where the different member states subscribe for the overall program, and now we are within this program, we are developing the different missions. There is, of course, always the question with the moon. This is, uh, you know, all of these discussions, um, whether one should go to the moon or not. There was in the past, uh, several people were saying, ah, the moon is just a dead rock. Don't go there. Um, better to go to other locations like Mars or asteroids. But it's clear now, and it's obvious that um, it was found on the uh, moon, uh, not only water, but also helium and other uh, nice, stuff, nice stuff. So it's, it's worthwhile. And by the way, if you think about human space uh, travel, Mars is really a very difficult uh, target because uh, to go there and back takes about two years. And uh, if we have an effect like Apollo 13, Houston, we have a problem then it's not possible. If you're on the way to Mars, you have to do it. And that means you have to go for another two years and this would be very difficult. So we need better technology. We need for the safety aspects, much better uh, spacecraft. Uh, the, the Apollo uh, astronauts were very lucky because there was no solar flare during their missions. 
So health is an issue, psychology is an is, is issue, radiation, as I mentioned already, and also communication. If you call from Mars, it depends where Mars is. It can take uh, very long and not like Houston, we have a problem within seconds. So we are going to Mars. Yes, we are going to Mars with a, a robotic mission. Uh, we started that in 2016 with ExoMars. ExoMars looks for extraterrestrial life. Uh, we had in 2016 a mission which is uh, uh, still in very good shape. Uh, it's a trace gas orbiter looking for the atmosphere of Mars. And in 2022, we will have another one. And, and this time uh, we will send a, a rover to the surface of Mars. And this rover should drill into the surface of Mars in order to look for life. And together with the Americans, um, we are planning a Mars sample return mission. Uh, this is a fascinating mission uh, where the, the uh, cooperation is really of a uh, critical issue. So the Americans are first looking for nice um, samples. They will put them in tiny containers uh, and the containers will be then laid down on the surface. Then a European uh, rover will come and look for these samples, uh, collect them, putting them together in a bigger canister bringing it, uh, bringing them to a small launch base. From this launch base, an American uh, launcher will bring it into the orbit of Mars. And then the canister uh, in the size of a football will fly alone around Mars and another European um, spacecraft should come and fetch it and bring it back to Earth. So this is really from the techno technological point of view, it's challenging, very nice, very nice, but at the same time, of course, from a scientific point, uh, it's very interesting. And I signed a couple of weeks ago the Memorandum of Understanding that we will do it again together. But this leads me to the question of humans to Mars. There are some people talking about colonization of Mars. I'm not at all happy with that because colonization for me would mean that people should stay there for the rest of their life. And I believe that this is not a good idea because uh, to live in a can is not really something I would like to do. I would like to go to Mars, but um, only if we have the right technology and I would like to go back. So this is not a solution for me. And by the way, some people who are advocating to go to other planets are saying because um, we need to go because our Earth is not in a good condition. This is a bad excuse not to take care of the Earth. And uh, maybe we have in future, I don't know whether you know this movie, 2000, uh, 2001, A Space Odyssey. Maybe we have some technology, but today we don't have it. And therefore, let's wait. And by the way, also, if you know this movie, if not, you should have a look. It's Stanley Kubrick. Um, it's very nice with hibernation and all of this. But there's also artificial intelligence already in that movie, Hail 9000, which is then the governing body on board, which... Uh, brings to some problem. And of course, we need also better spacecraft. So for instance, uh, something like this. Uh, during my travels through Germany, I found an interesting place in the northern part of Germany, where they are obviously building already something like that. No, it's not real. But uh, I think this is the technology or technologies we should really look into if we want to go further than just the moon. So the American vice president, uh, was announcing uh, a little bit more than one year ago, let's go back to the moon. And uh, this uh, sounds like a good idea, but I, from the very first moment, said, no, this is not a good idea. I don't want to go back to the moon. Why do I say that? Because very simple, going back to the moon means to do the same like 50 years ago. In race, in space, one nation against another nation is going to the moon. And uh, at that time, the Americans were winning congratulations. But this time, we should be a little bit smarter. We should go together, going forward to the moon. So in the wording is already some politics. And uh, at that time, also some years ago, I argued that one should have uh, next time when we are going to the moon, we should do it together. And I called it a multi-partner open concept, meaning many partners, an open architecture, open for each and everyone. And it's not just one project, but it's a, a permanent concept. Uh, and a journalist told me this is not a good narrative. You need a better narrative. And the idea then was Moon Village. Uh, moon Village means a village that uh, people, organizations from different countries are coming to together with different ideas. And the destination is Moon. 
it was interesting that I got in public a very nice criticism about that. So uh, in 2015, a head of a space agency said, this idea is neither moon nor village. Uh, today we know that he was wrong and that many countries are now going towards the moon. A uh, Scandinavian uh, company offered already uh, that they have the right houses, but they also misunderstood what we are going to do. What we are going to do is to go to the moon together from different countries with different uh, competencies, uh, capabilities. So Europe is with the European service module for the spacecraft Orion, uh, also on the way to the moon. This is with the rocket SLS. And um, this is just a view of this uh, European service module. So it's really a nice technological achievement. And we are very happy that we could deliver already several of them and we will uh, produce even more. Uh, so therefore that we have a permanent possibility to go to the moon. And of course, also on this way to the moon is the, the gateway. Um, and also I could sign two weeks ago, uh, NASA ESA MOU. In because we would like from our side, from Europe, we would like to produce several of the parts of this gateway to make it a, a very nice uh, and, uh, and for astronauts a feasible station to go from there to the surface of the moon or to remotely control rovers on the surface of the moon. We are developing in this respect also a European large logistics lander, which should bring also goods to the surface of the moon, for instance, also for, uh, for uh, astronauts who are there. So it's all looking to the moon, which is very nice. And with the Russians, we are uh, in development of a mission called Luna 27, where we are using the technology of the ExoMars uh, rover to drill in the surface uh, of the moon and look for things uh, with a small lab, what is over there. So the moon is also for us a part of lunar economy. So with a British company, we are developing now a telecommunication interface. So, um, and, but this is a commercial activity because what I believe is really, we should have much more commercial activities uh, on the surface of the moon and in space at all. So um, this, uh, we have another initiative, the Moonlight Initiative for Lunar Economy, which, which uh, includes not only the communication, but also navigation. So this is a joint activity of our Directorate for Human and Robotic Exploration for telecommunication and for navigation. And you see, this is the multi-directed uh, activities, which I mentioned earlier, and again, together with industry. You know, several of the ideas to have on the far side of the moon, uh, observatories to look deep into the universe. Uh, there are also the uh, ideas uh, to have humans on the on the moon. And the question is uh, also what to do there. So the Americans also developed already some uh, instruments to, to pave uh, uh, roads and uh, on the moon. So all of this is going forward, but for us, it's also the political question. When will we have European boots on the moon? As it always is this expression. And I said, okay, we can deliver the boots, that should not be the problem. But of course, we are also looking for astronauts. And I hope that until the end of this decade, we will have also European uh, astronauts on the surface of the moon uh, developing things. Now, if you allow me, I would like to go also a little bit into another dimension. The um, coronavirus is changing the world. It's a big, uh, big challenge and a threat. And many people died already. This is very sad. But at the same time, I see also some opportunities. And this is the digital transformation. We see possibilities in the future, the new normal, and you can develop it. That means the agencies have to have new roles. The space is changing. We have new structures. We have more performance orientation, new processes, and new opportunities. For us, it means, for instance, in a digital transformation to build digital twin spacecraft, digital twin Earth and universe, and digital twin ESA. So this is one of the ideas we are right now implementing digital twin Earth, for instance, to simulate all the processes on the surface of the Earth to look also, for instance, in climate change. But also digital twin spacecraft is important in order to simulate a spacecraft 100% in case of any uh, problem, we can easily simulate and find solution. Global digitalization is, of course, also a global opportunity. 
we have to take care of the digital divide when that means for instance also maybe with some uh, communication technologies that uh, really the whole world is connected i call it the synaptic structures of the future this is a big chance for you young people because uh, i'm believing that all of these uh, discussions and this digital transformation leads to new structures. I see that hierarchies are going away. I see it already now in this uh, pandemic. Hierarchies are going away. This is a big chance for organizations like ESA internally to go with synaptic structures, but also for the world. And uh, I think and I hope that this will really lead to a better understanding and better cooperation worldwide. You all know about new space. I will give you my personal interpretation what new space is. Normally new space is said, ah, these are the small companies building a rocket in their living room. This is not what I believe what new space is. I asked all of these small companies and they told me, no, no, Mr. Werner, DG, new space means cost reductions, commercialization, disruptive innovation, artificial intelligence, agility and flexibility. And if you see this, this may be also then possible for an agency like ESA to be new space. What is about the public situation, private and public sector in the future? I hope that this is on one line. And that means for me as ESA Director General, I'm developing now different roles for ESA. So we have, as in the past, we are a research and development entity and an agency working together with industry. But at the same time, we are a partner of industry, industry and public-private partnership where industry and, um, and ESA is investing. We are a customer. We are, for instance, for space debris removal, we ask a company to give us a service, a price tag for a service to remove uh, space debris. We are an enabler. We, allow, we give access to our data to industry so that they can really develop their own business. And finally, we are a broker, putting together different actors worldwide to work together and to do something for space because space should be something which is really bridging earthly crisis. Now, the question is what will happen in your future? Yesterday, all of these activities uh, which you see here were done in a public domain, national, bilateral, multinational or globally. But what is the future? In the future, this will move and you see that most, uh, many of these activities will go to commercial actors, more or less. Uh, science ex exploration, I, I believe, will remain public. Military security, civil security, nearest objects and space weather, uh, I believe, will mainly be uh, public, but all the other aspects, I believe, really will move. And this will be a totally new world of space. And therefore, it's important to come back to the understanding. Competition is a driver. Competition is good. Competition helps. Who would run 100 meter in less than 10 seconds uh, without any competition. I would use my car anyhow. So therefore competition is driver, but cooperation is an enabler. And we, as the citizens of the blue dot, we should really cooperate worldwide to enable things which are not possible for a single nation, for a single person or a single continent. And we need for the future continuation of the past, but we need really disruptive innovation. This is for me important and therefore we are planning right now the next ministerial and I hope together with you, we can make sure that space is also in future fascinating, inspiring and motivating. With that, I finish my presentation. I thank you very much. You see here, I hope that either will be the European new space agency and I'm ready to discuss with you whatever you like. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jan. That was a fantastic talk. You had me giggling and chuckling and really getting inspired along the way. So we already have a lot of questions for you. Um, so I'll go ahead and start with the, the first top voted question, which is from Dennis Dobb. Dear Jan, thank you very much for being with us today. In context of the stunning prog progress of SpaceX and Blue Origin to the United States, what are your thoughts on the future of the European launch industry? Okay, allow me a very blunt answer. I believe if the European launch industry is not changing rapidly, they will go, they will be gone. Uh, I told them that, so it's not a secret. Um, they are still believing that they get the money from the public side and uh, that's all. So uh, the European launch industry has to change, but there is an opportunity, uh, not copying, 
because some believe we should do exactly the same what Elon Musk is doing. I believe copying is uh, only in a few cases in the world it was successful. Copying is not a solution. To have disruptive ideas to go forward, that's the solution. Agreed. So our next question is um, from Anonymous. Dear Jan, being probably the most impacted by the pandemic, our generation will have to reinvent itself to thrive as the space workforce of tomorrow. Do you have any tips and suggestions for us to do so? Thank you for your leadership at ESA and worldwide in the international space community. I mean, uh, you are saying you are impacted by the pandemic. This is right and wrong. You are impacted, but I can tell you now I'm, I'm very, uh, very harsh. I'm more impacted than you are because uh, first of all, I'm older. This is already a bigger risk. The second one is my way of working during the last, I'm now 66, let's say during the last 30, 40 years was always to be in contact with people directly at the table, to discuss directly, to have students in front of me. This was my life. Now this, all of this is more or less gone. It's only this uh, computer, but all of you, you are young people, you are, you are really acquainted to this logic of using a computer for your daily life. So it's, you are less impacted than people like me. And I know this is, you, you know what I mean. Therefore, I, my recommendation, I normally, I don't give a recommendation, but find your own way, use the, the, the catastrophe of the pandemic as an opportunity for yourself to develop yourself and think about the synaptic structure. Don't ask hierarchies to do the work for you. Yeah, that's really good advice. Um, our next question is from Dave Borncamp. Three years seems like a small funding cycle when space projects can take decades. Is there anything you would change about how ESA gets its funding? Think about NASA, the most successful space agency of the world. What is their funding cycle? One year. So therefore, with the three years, we are, we are ahead of that. The problem is that most of the, the national legislation does not allow even for more than one year. So we have the same issue, but we have plans. We have programs which are now already planned for 2037. So in 17 years, so we have these programs. And because we have 22 member states, the good thing is it's rather stable. So I would have a lot of ideas to change ESA and I tried it very hard the last five years. Um, some of the things I could change, I can tell you this pillar, pillars, which look so trivial for you maybe, it was very difficult to convince member states that I'm using this uh, narrative. The downstream gateway, one face, uh, one space to the customer. It's trivial for you might be, it was very difficult. So we all have to work each and every one uh, to change the world to a better one. So kind of on that note then, we have a great question about um, when you were dealing with the member states ministers, you said that you that one of your negotiation secrets is the narrative. So can you give us an example of how that works? So um, the, you have, we have 22 member states and we have different languages. And um, this, these languages are not the, not the issue alone. So most of them are speaking the most common language of the world, which is broken English. Uh, so therefore, this is not the issue. We have officially, we have in ESA three languages. We have uh, English, French, and German. And so that means in our meetings, all these three languages can be used. That means uh, we always have to have interpreters to, uh, to help to translate, which I find really stupid because the discussion uh, through, uh, through translation is always worse. So therefore, this is not really. The cultural barrier, I don't see the cultural barrier. I see cultural diversity and I see it as an asset. An Italian and an Estonian or an, a Finnish and a Portuguese, they are really having them as totally different ways of thinking. And then we have uh, gender also, et cetera, et cetera. And this is an asset. We should see it as an asset that different people with different background have different input. So for me, this is not a barrier. This is a big uh, beauty, beauty of ESA. So language is possible, um, but uh, the, and the cultural barriers I don't see. That's good, that's encouraging. Um, again, kind of on that note. So 
I mean, given your experience at ESA, this question comes from Mimi Houston. What advice would you give to other global cooperative efforts, kind of like the Paris Accords, about how to, to come together and work towards ambitious missions like mitigating climate change? Again, I repeat, I'm normally, I, I'm hesitant to give recommendations to others. I try always to, to go the way of doing what I believe is correct. And if other people see what I'm doing, they can either think this is a good way, let's go forward or not. I think regulations, rules, and all of this are just of second order for humankind. First should be ethics, moral. And if we all go that, that way, then the world will be better. And uh, we need less rules, less regulations, uh, less regulations. I know this sounds trivial, but sometimes uh, to be trivial is a better way to go forward than always to look just for rules and regulations. I agree. So um, you mentioned in your presentation about Space 19 when it was approved by the biggest ESA budget in history. How did ESA adapt to the current pandemic to continue its space projects? Yeah, so I very early, I decided to send people home. This was very early when other countries were not discussing about it and so on. We, we really sent the people home. I decided that I was alone with the decision. I got harsh criticism, but I sent them home and say, stay home and work from home. We have the possibility with the computers we had already during the normal times, we had teleworking was, was a possibility for our people. And they did perfectly so. So we had 95% of staff already late uh, February, beginning of March, stayed at home. And I must say, there were some very positive results. For instance, our time to payment from uh, after we get the bill from industry until we pay, there's some procedures which have to be fulfilled, whether they really did what they are claiming for, et cetera, et cetera. We could reduce the time by factor of two. We were two times faster than before because of COVID, because of the teleworking. So it was had also some advantages. Um, so we sent them home and then gradually we asked to come back. Uh, we were in August, we were back to 20%, 25%. But now if we are, as we are in the second wave, or I call it even a flood, uh, we sent them home again. Um, so I tell you the following for this, this teleworking, for most of our activities, it's really possible. Uh, I call it the, the following. If you want to decide about C and you know A and B, then you can do that very excellently through teleworking. If you don't know about A, that's difficult. And this is a job of a DG. I feel my job is always to look for A, what to do, why to do, and not I do it because I already have the steps defined before. This is difficult, but maybe in, in the next generation can even handle that one. So ESA was performing very well during the pandemic. We had to take care of some individuals who could not, who did not like to stay at home because they were alone in a tiny apartment in Paris or in wherever. Uh, so we had to take care of those people. And we allowed also the people to go home in their country, in their host, in their, in their family country. So we were very flexible. So ESA performed very well so far. It's nice to hear how flexible everything was. Um, sometimes it could be a little difficult, at least here in the States for that way. But um, our next question comes from Mina Takla. Does ESA have, have a plan to partner with emerging space countries on lunar exploration? You are how jumping can over one question. Why do you do that? Oh, sorry, I originally had it up higher. <laughs> I'll come no, back to it after. <laughs> no, I was happy that you jumped over it, but uh, I think we should. I should also answer difficult questions. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we'll hit that one afterwards. So um, we'll okay. hit Mina's first. Okay. Okay. Um, so how can emerging countries get involved in lunar exploration? And basically does ESA have RFPs or is it hosting payloads on its spacecraft and what payloads and subsystems are needed? Yeah. We have in all our missions, we have also uh, payloads uh, beyond the ESA frame. So we have each and every mission of ESA is a multinational mission. That's very normal. That's also with NASA the same. Uh, and we have sometimes also payload from totally different countries, far outside from ESA, not only uh, NASA, but also emerging countries. And um, again, the, the, the open concept which ESA has also to deliver data, et cetera, helps these countries 
to go ahead. So we have, for instance, with South Africa, with Nigeria, we have very strong links also to give them opportunities to do something together. Uh, and this is uh, the, the way ESA is working with this um, uh, different countries working together in one mission, which sometimes is a little bit more expensive than if it would be just one country, but it, it brings something better. It brings a cooperation beyond uh, borders. And therefore, yes, we are open for that. And we have also uh, those type of, uh, of uh, payloads. And we had one mission some weeks ago with 53 satellites at once, uh, where we had uh, also uh, some some spacecraft from emerging countries, some uh, satellites. So we can do that and we do, we are doing it. That's wonderful. Okay, well, we'll do the tough question now <laughs> from you two. <laughs> do you expect any significant changes to Artemis under the new US administration or is everything already internationally agreed and settled so far that this yeah. is not to be feared? You have to understand that Artemis is two things. Uh, Artemis is the Artemis Accord which is an international accord of, of states, of governments. So we are not a government. We are not part of the Artemis Accord. So therefore, this is nothing where I can say something. For me, Artemis is a program. Um, and I believe that this program will go on. And so far, we, we will see what is happening. But uh, again, space uh, has to overcome also those problems. We have in either 22 member states the normal duration of a government is something like four years. So that means we have in ESA five times a year we have elections. Uh, and therefore we know uh, that uh, space can uh, also work beyond uh, these, uh, these uh, national elections. But of course now, uh, if the, the uh, result of the election in the US is confirmed, we have to see whether there is any impact on the cooperation. I hope not, because we had all the time during um, the period of Bush, as well as uh, with Obama, as now also with under Trump, we had good relations with NASA. And this is very important for us. It's our premium partner. Absolutely. Um, so we have a time for a few more questions. Um, our next one is, does ESA currently have a plan for helium-3 mining? No, okay. we have one of our member states, Luxembourg. Luxembourg is very much interested in uh, resource, uh, uh, resource mining on, on uh, other bodies, but not ESA as such. Mm. Okay. Our next question is, can you please speak to ESA's traffic, space traffic management efforts, both within Europe and it, um, in partnership with other nations and regions? Yeah, so we have, um, we, I'm as the director general, I'm very much in favor of having also a European contribution, strong contribution to space traffic management, but our contribution would be mainly technical, so not the legal aspects. Uh, and this, the legal aspect there, we have the situation, our 22 member states are of totally different interests and also different sizes. So if you compare France, which is uh, the, the, the the country in either which has the biggest uh, space uh, budget and if you look for countries like uh, let's say uh, Latvia or Estonia so that it, it's obvious that they have different opinions also from um, military security which has some link to um, to space traffic management so we are just providing tech technological aspects and we hope that we uh, can play also a role when uh, regulatory aspects are done in Europe, but this is not either. Of course. Yeah. Well, um, oh, we have, uh, we have one more question, so we'll get to that. Um, to quote you, space has no borders. Thus space, and, um, space is and should be the ground for peaceful activities. From this perspective, what is your opinion on international cooperation for ADR, especially for LEO and also for moon exploration? Yeah. For us, uh, ESA has in its convention exclusively peaceful purpose. There, so therefore I can say very easily, I'm just interested only in uh, peaceful purpose. I don't believe that we need uh, the space for military actions. Uh, we should not use it and we don't need it. And that means also we should not build fences and walls on the surface of the moon. As Germans, we, we know what it means to have walls. Um, and uh, we don't want to build new walls uh, uh, on the surface of the moon. 
Of course. Well, I think that's pretty inspiring to end on. So Jan, thank you so much for being with us today and being a constant support for SGAC and all of our events. We really appreciate it. Thank you very much to all of you and uh, look into the future. Okay, thank, thank you. Thank you. Jan. Goodbye. And all now right. I hand it off.